hey folks, let's learn something new about the oil and gas industry, shall we? All right, my apologies, but this year we've just been so damn busy. Um, this is our monthly email show, but we're going to have to condense October, November, and December emails into this one show. So for next year, we'll try not to let this happen again, but let's go ahead and get started. All right, first thing, um, number one, I don't understand how you can support hydraulic fracking. Even if it can be done safely, it depletes a precious recess, water. You can't drink oil. So you're right in the fact that hydraulic fracking does use water, but we need to put this in perspective. So let me throw some numbers out there um, the, the, um, furnished by the Department of Economic Development at the federal government level. So in order to get a million BTUs of, of energy, and a BTU is just a measurement of energy, from hydraulic fracking, you need to use about three gallons of water. To get that same amount of energy from nuclear power, use 11 gallons of water. From coal, 23 gallons of water. And from corn ethanol, you know, biofuel, use 15,800 gallons of water. So yes, you do use water, hydraulic fracking, but it uses the least amount of water of almost all of our energy sources. And then the other thing is you have to figure in is because of hydraulic fracking, our electrical uh, generating plants are switching from coal to natural gas. Now remember the numbers I just spouted back to you. Because we're gonna quit using coal, we're actually gonna conserve that water. So we're gonna actually, if you do the math, end up with a surplus of fresh water by switching from coal to hydraulic fracking. So get your facts straight, understand what's going on before you make a decision. Number two, uh, quick. Worst thing to say when meeting a prospect for the first time. My favorite thing, the worst thing to say is what keeps you up at night. Come on people, stop that. When you tell somebody that, what keeps you up at night, what you're really saying is, look, I don't understand your business or what's going on, so I'm hoping that you'll tell me some hot topics. Don't do that. That's not what a professional salesperson does. You walk into that meeting and you tell them, this is what's keeping you up at night because you've done your research. Um, number three, what is a semi-submersible? All right, a semi-submersible is an oil rig that's not anchored to the bottom um, of, the, of, the, of the ocean floor. It basically can float. Now, the smaller ones are self-propelled, and the large ones, they either put on a barge or they use a tug. And when they get in position, they fill them up with water so they sink halfway, hence the name semi-submersible. They're very stable, even in rough water, and you can get much deeper than you can get with a jack-up rig. So it's one of the most popular rigs out there. Um, number four, what would be your number one suggestion in oil and gas on how to be seen as a trusted advisor versus being seen as a salesperson? Probably the number one thing you can do is go ahead and make up your mind that you can have difficult conversations around difficult topics. Salespeople tend to skip over that because it's, um, it's not leading directly to a sale. An advisor wants to know what's the problems that you're dealing with. You know, what are the, the um, elephants in the closet? So if you resolve to, to handle those difficult topics first, you will be seen more as a trusted advisor than a salesperson. Um, number five, going to answer that bench press question? No. I wish y'all would quit asking me that. Um, number six, is it true that there's a labor shortage in the energy industry? So first thing, it's not energy, all right? It's oil and gas. Get it straight. Um, second thing, yeah, there is a huge talent shortage in the oil and gas industry, both in the skilled and, and unskilled labor. I mean, they're hiring kids around high school in the Dakotas at 80000 a year just to be a general hand on the rig, and they don't have enough of them. And people like, um, say, reservoir engineers and geologists are making five times what they were making 10 years ago. It's crazy. I will give you a couple of pointers. So if you're a college kid getting ready to go to school, or if you're an adult thinking about going back and get some education, I can tell you what the hot jobs are right now. Number one is mechanical engineering. Huge demand for those guys. And then a field service tech, which you wouldn't think, but there's a shortage of field service people. Um, a quality assurance inspector, and then a geologist. So those things are in the highest um, demand right now, and they're, they're, therefore they're getting the highest dollars. Number seven, oceaneering was just added to my account list. Any pointers? Oceaneering is a cool little company. I say little, they're about $2 billion a year service company. They predominantly do subsea stuff. Think about ROVs, subsea engineering. But the funny thing is they also make amusement rides, like Disney rides. So that's what makes them a fun little company. Um, <clears throat> they're about 10,000 employees globally, and their business culture is pretty modern. Um, they are quick to seize any new technology that will help them with their clients. Um, and, and they're easy to get to know um, because they have a relatively flat org structure for an oil and gas service company. So I hope that helps with your account penetration, and good luck to you. Um, number eight, is having a social strategy important in oil and gas? Yes. Now I can tell you this much, forget Facebook and Twitter. 
Um, I actually think those are kind of taking a nosedive in the rest of the industry. Because oil and gas, nobody uses that. Your social strategies, a couple of things you need to think about. You need to have blog with relative good content, and it could be long-form content. You know, the oil and gas industry is full of engineers. They love to read facts and figures and look at graphs and charts. Um, email still works in oil and gas. Email campaigns are important. So is cold calling, believe it or not. Because we're so old-fashioned, people still answer the telephone in this industry. Um, events. And then the thing that's growing right now is the use of mobile. So you need to make sure that you have a mobile strategy. And my preference would be a responsive website. So instead of having a mobile-only website that you would link to and the, your mobile um, viewers would go to that website, if you have a responsive website that automatically adopts to whatever screen size, that's the best way to go. And if you don't know what I mean when I say that, uh, talk to your webmaster. Um, number nine, I'm embarrassed to ask this. Thank God for anonymous postings. But it is nipple up a real term? Yeah, it does sound like something out of a porn film, doesn't it? But nipple up is a real term. Basically, when the crews are putting together a blowout preventer or a stack, blowout preventer stack, BOP stack, the process of laying those parts and pieces out and putting them together is called nipple up. So they're nippling up a BOP stack. Um, number 10, I'm a sales manager for a large technology company, and I spend so much of my time firefighting that I have little time to help my team learn more about the oil and gas industry. Help. I can tell you what you need to do. You're not probably going to like to hear it, but you're constantly firefighting means that you need to work on your list of priorities, and you also need to attack the underlying reason for those reoccurring problems. So it's up to you to figure out what that is and get that straight so you can free up time to help educate your sales team. So there we go. Uh, last three months of the year, emails. I hope that helps you. Um, from our family to yours, we wish you a very happy new year. Uh, 2014 is, is setting itself up to be probably one of the most prosperous New Year's in the oil and gas market. Um, so from us to you, we hope you have a great prosperous New Year.